fear. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. It's the opposite of what fools do, according to verse 7. So it's the beginning of wisdom and instruction. And actually, this is a mantra that we see all the way through uh, the book of Proverbs. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. The fear of the Lord prolongs life, but the years of the wicked shall be shortened. Do not, do not let your heart envy sinners, but live in the fear of the Lord always. And when it says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom or knowledge, it's not saying that's where you start from and then you're going to move on to other things to gain wisdom. It's saying that this is the heart of wisdom. It's the central theme, the pillar on which we can build to become wise. And so as we start our new series today, we're going to begin where wisdom begins, the fear of the Lord. So firstly, we're going to see wisdom the fear that takes away fear. Uh, in his inaugural address, after becoming president of the United States, Franklin Roosevelt famously said the line, there is nothing to fear but fear itself. He said that line in 1933, when the US, the UK, and much of the world was in the Great Depression, and he was calling for brave economic action. But was he right? He was trying to promote calm during a troubled period as people were worried about their jobs. They were worried about making ends meet. They were worried that their money wasn't going to go as far as it used to. I wonder if that sounds familiar. You know, things are not as bad uh, now as they were then, but many of us are feeling the pressure of prices going up, and it could be hard to know the way forward. We face an uncertain future in our world, and it's easy for fear to start creeping into our lives. Now, I don't know about you, but when I'm afraid, when I'm stressed, that is not when I'm at my most wise. In fact, it can often be quite the opposite. But Solomon is passing on to us that the fear of the Lord is the root to wisdom, and it seems it's a lesson that he learned from his own father, King David. You see, David, in our Psalm 34 passage that we had read earlier, he had made some bad decisions due to fear. The context of that chapter that was read uh, is that David had become so popular uh, with the people, they had angered the current king, King Saul, and he tries to kill David. David runs for his life, and fear, as it so often does, leads to him making poor decisions. In his hunger, he, uh, when he's on the run, he ends up lying to steal bread from the priests. And then he ends up going to Gath, the capital city, of his greatest enemies, the Philistines. And it's not quite clear from the Bible why he goes there. He was probably hoping to be a mercenary, a soldier for hire, uh, which was very common in those days. It was obviously before the days of TV or, or phones or, or cameras. And so you might know of a person, but you might well not know what they look like. So he was hoping to remain an anonymous soldier. But it seems that David underestimates his famousness. One of the servants of Achish, king of Gath, recognizes David and says, isn't this David who people sing about killing our people? And he has him arrested and he reports to the king. And David is terrified. He's a man without a country in the middle of a city of people he's defeated many times in battle. And they would jump at the chance to kill him. And so he's afraid. And there and then he prays and he cries out to the Lord to be saved. And when the king of Gath turns up, David decides to pretend to be mad. He's scribbling on the walls and dribbling down his beard. And Achish the king sees him and he says, I've got plenty of madmen in my city. I don't need another one. And he throws David out of the city and he's safe. Now, David could have taken uh, a credit for his escape. I'm sure it would have made a brilliant story to tell his men, but how he had sort of outwitted the king of Gath. But David is clear. He knows it was not his acting skills that got him out of trouble. He knows he was directly saved by God. There is no doubt in his mind that it was God who saved him 
from his predicament. Verse 6 and 7 says, This poor man called out, and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and he delivers them. So this situation had turned David's fear into the fear of the Lord, which Proverbs says is the beginning of wisdom. And this is something that uh, comes up again and again in Proverbs. We read uh, this in Proverbs 14. Whoever fears the Lord has a secure fortress, and for their children it will be a refuge. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life, turning a person from the snares of death. See, rather than fear being something that takes our peace, it seems to be the only source of security and safety and life. So how can that be? Well, fear is different from the fear of the Lord. And firstly, we see it's about perspective. We are people who like to measure things. I wonder if some of you have got something like this. You can't see it too clearly, but this is the door in the lounge of my parents' house. Uh, And all along it, you can see the different heights uh, of of my brothers and I and some of our friends. And each year we were trying to, you know, make it further up the door, you know, to, to beat the next person along there. But we love measuring things uh, as, as, hu- as human beings, whether it's height or weight or something like that. We're always comparing things. And David considers his situation, and he is in real danger. We can't belittle what he's going through. He has the right to fear for his life. God never minimizes the difficult things that we go through. But David cries out to God and brings his fears to him, and he compares them. And as he looks at God, he sees that he is the only being who is measureless. When God reveals himself to Moses in the burning bush, he says his name is, I am who I am. And that's because God is not like something else. He is only like himself. He is absolute and boundless. He doesn't have a beginning or an end. He is an infinite ocean, and he extends infinitely in every direction of intelligence and power and goodness and justice. He cannot be measured. Uh, Years ago, I went to uh, the US, and I got to see the Grand Canyon. And I remember going up to the viewing platform and looking over it, and it was strange because it was like you were standing too close. You just couldn't take it all in at the same time. It was just too big. And when David puts his heartfelt, realistic fears next to God to compare them, he can't. His response in the face of a situation where he could easily die is to say, what can man do to me? His fears are banished when he thinks about who God is. And this is where we start to see what the fear of the Lord is. The first step in gaining wisdom is knowing that wisdom does not come from us. Saving power does not come from us. Wisdom starts by declaring the opposite of the first sin. Adam and Eve wanted to be God. Genesis 3 says they ate the fruit because they wanted wisdom. Wisdom separate from God. And that same longing in, is in us as well, for us to be our God. But true wisdom is the opposite of that. It's humbling ourselves and saying, God, you alone are God. The fear of the Lord dries out fear because the fear of the Lord is to understand how big our God is. All things belong to him, and he is sovereign. And in life, there are so so many things that are outside of our control. Our wisdom will only go so far. But we know a God who holds everything in his hands. David had made some poor decisions, but he calls out to God and humbles himself, and God answers him. The thing is, it's easy to humble ourselves when God answers us. But what about when it seems like he doesn't? You know, there'll be people here who are going through really difficult situations at the moment. And honestly, we don't want to humble ourselves before God, 
because we don't like the situation we're in and he doesn't seem to be taking us out of it. Many of us will have been through times like that and perhaps you are going through something like that at the moment where we have nothing left, where God doesn't seem to be answering our prayers, where situations are not changing and we don't know why God has allowed it. And worldly wisdom would say there is no hope in these times. There have been times of difficulty in my life where I didn't have the answers. And honestly, I still don't. But the only thing that I can tell you is that I am so glad that I had Jesus going through that time. Because he was the only thing I could hold on to. See, the Bible says there are two types of wisdom. There's the wisdom of man, which the Bible calls foolishness. It's a wisdom that relies on the self, but only leads to fear, because so much is outside of our control. And ultimately, in the difficult times, it doesn't come up with good answers. And then there's wisdom in the eyes of God. We can read about it in 1 Corinthians. Paul writes, brothers and sisters, think of what you, of what you were when you were called Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many of you were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of the world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us Wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. When we don't understand the situation we're in and we've come to the end of our human wisdom, the bottom line is always Jesus. He doesn't just have wisdom, he is wisdom. And coming to him with empty hands and saying, I can't work out of my situation, but I can bring my situation to you in my brokenness. This is really the only wisdom that I can pass on to you, the fear of the Lord. So are we willing to come before God with empty hands so that we can hold on to him?